Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to chapter two of the masterclass that I'm making on the Nimzo Indian defense. Today, we are going to look at the Nimzo Indian defense after bishop to b4 and white playing e3, we castle, as discussed in the previous chapter. And in the previous chapter, we looked at bishop to d3, which is very natural. White is trying to develop and castle. Here we're going to look at what happens if they try to employ a different strategy. What happens if they go knight g to e2, which is very common, and the idea is uh, also quite obvious. White is trying to over-defend this knight with a piece, therefore preparing the move a3. After a3 is played, we have a dilemma. If we choose to take, they're going to take back, we get rid of our good bishop, and usually we get rid of the bishop to stack and double their pawns, but here we're not even getting that. They're simply going to recapture with a piece. Therefore, instead of a3, we're going to retreat. So for example, d5, a3, we're going to go bishop e7. And now their idea is to develop this knight and then develop the bishop and castle and claim that the knight still will have some good future. Now, this seems very good for them. It seems like they're sort of covering every single avenue. But the issue with this is that it takes quite some time. They're delaying developing the bishop, first moving the knight twice, also wasting a move with a3, then they'll have to take out their bishop and castle and in the meantime, we're going to get good play in the center. Notice we've already castled, developed our kingside pieces and have pretty equal stake in the center. So for these reasons, uh, this setup is not so harmful, even though it seems on the surface to achieve many of the goals and tasks that white wants to achieve. So knight ge2. We're going to play d5, as I showed. And here, a3 is the main move we're going to cover there's really no other logical move. I mean, if they move the knight away at this stage, then what's the point of even developing it here? Why not just develop it normally here? Uh, or maybe let's develop the bishop first and then move out so we can at least... Ca I mean, it, it just it doesn't make too much logic. They're mixing two different, very different uh, opening strategies together. So it's, it's generally not going to work too well for them. And I did show you, for example, one option you have, not the only... Uh, definitely not the only option, but for example, we can try an early tactic because of their opening mistakes. Uh, here, if they take, then after queen takes on d1, king takes on d1, we have knight to g4, going for the fork, going for the pawn back, and it's already a little unfortunate. Their pieces, uh, although developed, uh, aren't too meaningful, while our pieces are very strong here, especially look at this knight. Therefore, the majority of the video, we're going to be covering the most logical and common continuation, which is a3. We're going to drop the bishop back to e7 here. I find that on d6, um, at some point, not necessarily immediately, perhaps immediately, uh, but whenever they like, they can try c5, forcing us to move again. And it seems more vulnerable on d6, even though it seems more active. Uh, I prefer... Uh, to actually place it on e7, where it's sort of out of the way and later can shine. Now, in this position, they have a number of moves, and this is kind of the starting position, because again, a3 is more or less expected because of their strategy. So this is sort of where we're going to start branching off. We're going to specifically cover three variations. One of the variations is, of course, what if they just take, right? What if, what if they just deal with the tension in the center? The other two variations are, what if they move their knight away, uh, either to f4 or g3, and this really falls um, more in line with their strategy. Again, they wanted to put the knight here temporarily to kick away our bishop, and then to bring it to a brighter future, and also looking to finish developing and castling. A final touch that I will mention is, after d5, they can immediately take, but this will just transpose because after we take back, again, a3 is the most logical. And then we're just transposing into if they play a3 and then take. And so to that extent, let's begin with this variation. So what happens after they take on d5? This also happens to be the main move played um, in most of the games in the database. I find that actually rather surprising uh, because this 
poses zero issues for us. We actually really like this sort of structure because with attention gone, we can simply focus on our development and we have pretty good development. Um, it depends on exactly how you want your pieces to be arranged, but you have good flexibility. Typically, the pawn will come to c6, the knight will develop perhaps to c7 via a6 or to b6 via d7. Another possibility is to move the rook to e8 and then even take a Roy Lopez type of approach with knight to d7, knight to f8, and then knight to e6 or g6. Now, the bishop is sometimes very often feeling left out in these sort of structures, but there's no shame in not developing the bishop. And I actually picked a game example just so we can kind of see what this development could look like. And in this game example, I want you to notice this bishop. It takes a good chunk of moves for it to actually move out of its opening square, and that is okay. You don't need to rush to develop every single piece. Um, it's a, that's a very sort of beginner way to think about the game where you have to develop everything before making other progress. That's not true. And you'll see how at a very top level uh, with this game example, uh, that is just not uh, what happens. So in the game, bishop takes a six was not played, but I do want to just quickly mention what happens if they take. Uh, if they take at any point on a6, we're happy to take back. The ruined pawn structure is no issue for us. It's hard to attack it, uh, especially with their light square bishop gone. And the b file that we're getting in exchange uh, for this ruined pawn structure is definitely sufficient uh, compensation, especially when considering the bishop now has a totally different and unopposed avenue to develop through. Uh, so... You know, we're going to assume they don't take, and that is indeed what happened in the game. Here, notice the knight went to e6. We have a5. Knight hops back to e8. Many moves uh, in order to get good space in the center with f5. And what you should notice here is the position is very closed in nature. There's one tension point, and that's one that black is trying to contest quite a lot. But other than that, uh, the position is very closed. And so you can get away with not developing every piece. Additionally, because it's closed, you have a lot of time. You don't need to worry about these long maneuvers that seem you know, impossible to get away with with these knights because they're totally uh, possible and very often the most strategical um, and objectively best moves that you can play. And so don't worry about seemingly wasting time or not developing every piece in these closed structures. Um, you can see g6, a very symmetrical way to play, really eyeing towards this center square on e4. And only um, now, many moves later, does the bishop even develop. But again, that's okay, because there was no need for it to develop, and it very nicely actually tucks away here on f7, where it's again out of the way. Uh, and the position is very natural. I mean, the queen can come to this very nice dark square on f6, there's no worries for us, and at some point we can consider good expansions here on the uh, queen side. You can also play on the king side. There's many ways to go about playing this sort of position, and here you indeed see black playing on the king side instead, winning some material, and uh, very nice tactic to fully open up white's position. Again, the focus with these game examples is not necessarily the middle game or end game, uh, but more so the development and the developing schemes that you can employ. Here, of course, white resigned in view of the checkmate that is inevitable on g1. Okay, going all the way back, that was the main move, um, but in my opinion, not the most critical move and certainly not the one that is um, worth investigating the most amount of energy on because it's uh, just a, a very plain position that we get to with very calm developments for both players. Let's focus on a more energetic approach, knight g3. Here we strike with c5. We want to equalize the position on the center control, um, and they're posed with two options, uh, to take here or to take here. Otherwise, we're happy, for example, if they just develop we're happy in many cases to take, put the queen here, do some of the natural stuff that you've seen so far and you will see in the continuation of this masterclass. So let's begin with what happens if they take on d5. 
we take, they take back, we take back. And here, if they continue taking, our queen gets out to a very uh, fine position. Here, after bishop e2, we can, of course, take their rook, so they have to start with f3, but now that gives us good time to develop. It also weakens their king, you can see with these checks. Um, and, I mean, total domination on the board. Their king is left wide in the open. Again, this is just from natural development, right? We're, we're simply seizing space with c5 and then capturing in the center. Um, so that's c takes. They can also, of course, not take back. They can just play bishop d3, in which case they do manage to castle and get out of the opening okay. But even here, it's not so strong for them. We can take, for example, and go g6. And our structure is very solid in these sort of positions. Notice the idea with g6 is to... Uh, get rid and oppose this light square bishop, but at the same time keep our king very safe with the um, future of putting the bishop on g7 where it will be an absolute monster to play against for white. So that is what happens after c takes on d5. If d takes on c5 instead, we have even a objectively simpler uh, way to play. We simply take back again, as a reminder, they take here, we take here. They take here, we take here. Very simple to uh, remember. So takes, takes. And now, uh, if they take, then we're very happy in this sort of symmetrical position because notice the difference in the symmetry is their knight, which is by no means better on this square. In fact, our knight is closer to the center. And because they've wasted time getting the knight to this square, that is, again, by no means better, we've managed to castle and get a good rook in the center. So we can continue something like knight to c6. The bishop can go back, and we seize a lot of space in the center. Both of our bishops get very active, um, and you know at some point the king can, the king can start retreating back uh, into the center. We're very happy in this position. We have good center control, and all of our pieces are in meaningful squares. So after d takes on c5 and we take back on c4, they can, instead of trading, go queen c2. But this takes some time, and here we have a very nice approach that is actually fairly thematic to this sort of position. When we get a pawn, and very often we do manage to get a pawn on c4, you always want to consider, what if we can defend this pawn with b5? Now, of course, if they were to simply let us have the pawn here, then we're very happy. But of course, the critical move is what if they take? Now, taking uh, very often will not work well for them because we don't even need to recapture. We go bishop b7. We've essentially um, exploded our development by playing this move, sacrificing the pawn, where they've wasted time taking. In the meantime, we've used very valuably our time to develop the bishop in a strong position where now this bishop is also feeling a bit... Uh, left out, and after takes, knight to d7, we're fairly happy here. The pawn on a7 looks uh, pretty dangerous, but in reality, it's nothing to be worried about. We can take at any moment. Notice, if bishop takes, of course, they leave this pawn hanging, so again, they have to resort to this very sad f3 move, after which we can seize the uh, tempo they wasted by defending the pawn and also looking to maybe utilize this nice square on d3. So e4, now queen to b6. At some point, we will, of course, recapture uh, the pawn, but first we have to move the knight. Now, you can go knight g6. That's definitely one fair approach where we want to take back, uh, probably, preferably with the rook to get the quick ability to stack. We want to use these light square outposts that we still have because of the tempo. We'll be able to defend this pawn with the bishop coming to a6, and we are, again, pretty happy. Another approach is to use the light squares immediately, knight d3 check, and after takes, the pawn looks very weak, but uh, again, we can defend it um, a some, at some point with the bishop coming to a6, or maybe even in some cases, even managing to come to c2, but even if we lose it, notice we'll be able to get enough compensation for it in terms of our pieces. So even if they manage to put their pieces on, a, on squares that attack this pawn and eventually take it, our pieces are so active that it's going to be very difficult to do this. If they ever move this knight, we can try to infiltrate. You know, If they ever move this knight, our bishop can also uh, spread some fire on this diagonal. So it is very hard for them to find ways to make progress. Meanwhile, we have extra space. 
very good development and a very comfortable total position. Now, the final uh, variation that we are going to look at is instead of going knight g3, what if they come and play knight to f4? Now, against knight f4, playing the move c5 is a little bit less um, advantageous for us for the simple reason that their knight is more active here uh, when it comes to defending and controlling the center. And they can consider uh, very seriously just winning some material here. Our pawn could become a liability. So we don't want to allow their queen to enter into uh, the position. So we play a much more solid approach where we're actually defending this potential liability by playing c6. What you'll notice is that we get this sort of Slav setup here, which is really solid, but actually carries quite some venom. Because, for example, if they play bishop d3, we're going to take, uh, and then we're happy to either go b5 or, more solidly, knight to b6. With tempo, we get good development. We can even strike first in the center and actually move the knight to e5. Um, sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not, but when it is, it's very powerful to attack uh, the bishop from a more centralized square. Uh, but alternatively, you could also very much go knight b6 and then even use this open d5 uh, square for one of your knights. Uh, but going back to pushing, getting control in the center, and again, the ideas are plentiful for us. Their development is um, very much an issue here, and our development is quite clear. Again, bishop to f5, as the arrow suggests, and the rooks will find home on one of these three files. Now, alternatively, they can instead take here. We're going to definitely take back with this pawn because it leaves the ability for this bishop to develop. Also notice the pawn structure becomes no longer symmetrical. So we're going for some sort of unbalanced position, which allows uh, for good tension and uh, both players, the ability to go for a win, which is probably what we want. We want to be able to fight for a winning advantage um, in a position like this. And our development is really simple. So you're probably going to choose to develop the knight either through d7 or through a6, as we've sort of seen so far. Uh, for example, bishop d3, we can now look at what happens if we instead choose to develop the knight through d7, another very uh, possible choice. We can go rook e8. One possibility is to go to b6. One is to go to f8. And we're very happy. You might be wondering, what about this bishop? Well, there's a few options. First, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's no shame in leaving the bishop on here for some time, letting the position develop and unfold, and then choosing where to place the bishop to maximize its potential. But another possibility is to, if we go through f8, trade this knight off and then the bishop can land here. Sometimes it's possible even to trade the bishop off and then the knight uh, is, is uh, no longer opposed on this centralized e6 square. You can definitely still go for something over here on the queen side. The positions, um, the, the position in front of us and the positions in general that you'll get in the Nimzo Indian allow for so much flexibility, regardless of whether you're open to trading more or you want to keep more pieces on the board or, you know, you want to fight for a more crazy uh, position or maybe keep it more calm, just, you know, trade your pieces off and uh, go from there. The Nimzo can um, really fulfill all of those different playing styles. Um, and hopefully this video, along with the previous one and along with the next many videos in this masterclass, will show you that. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe if you are new around here. Like this video if you enjoyed and learned something new from it. And I will see you next time. Peace out.